done deal. An historic trillion dollar compromise to rebuild America's infrastructure. But can this Democratic president and Republican leaders prevent hardliners from sinking the agreement? On the troubled border, a vice presidential visit many believe was long overdue. Was it triggered by the impending return of Donald J. Trump? Here at home, the mayor and city council hammer Houstonians with a $2 billion hike in the price they will pay for water. Is the shared sacrifice justified or an unnecessarily deep dive into our wallets? I'm Greg Grugan and welcome to the 300th edition of What's Your Point, where our panelists continue to call it like they see it. Let's greet them. Starting us off, well-known businessman and columnist Bill King. Next up, writer, educator, and Chicano activist Tony Diaz. In the three spot, longtime super neighborhood leader Tamaro Bell. Batting cleanup, Marcus Davis, restaurateur and host of Fish, Grits, and Politics. And closing us out, Bob Price, associate editor of Breitbart, Texas. Let's begin. Roads, bridges, dams, ports, power grids, the skeletal structure of our national economy and one of America's rare intersections of near unanimous consensus, that is widespread agreement that our vital infrastructure is critically overdue for refurbishing and replacement. This week, in an isolated example of bipartisanship, President Joe Biden agreed to a trillion dollar compromise, long on funding for bricks and mortar, and minus his controversial investment in so-called human capital. They have my word, I'll stick with what they propose, and they've given me their word as well. So where I come from, that's good enough for me. And yet within hours, troubling signs began emerging that this deal could easily unravel at the seams, with many Democrats insisting that the social programs included in Biden's original plan be repackaged and approved in a parallel piece of legislation. Panel key Republicans called that demand a deal buster. I'm going to start with you, uh, Bob Price. What do you think of this compromise's chances of actually coming to fruition? Well, we've learned that the value of the president's word is about two hours. Uh, that's how long it took him to come back and renege on, on the deals that he made and demand that the tax increases that he said wouldn't be done be added into this parallel bill that would be done through reconciliation without any Republican input whatsoever. So, you know, the government is looking to spend massive, massive amounts of money that we just don't have. Um, and print more, we're already getting into an inflationary cycle because of this, this is gonna fuel that even more. And it, it's uh, a lot of social spending that has absolutely nothing to do with infrastructure. If you just focus on infrastructure, you know, I drove I-10 to San Antonio this week. It, it's clear that we need infrastructure rebuilding in this country. That road is turning into a four wheel drive only transit, it seems like. So let's focus on getting the roads, bridges, internet access, all of these types of things fixed and, and leave the social programs for other legislation. All right, Marcus Davis, jump in here. <laughs> Do you see this as the same old gridlock between uh, Democrats and Republicans? We, we thought we actually had a bipartisan deal here. Yeah, if, if, if we do have a deal, then it's not uh, the gridlock. If we don't, then yes, it is business as usual. I see nothing wrong with uh, identifying what both parties agree with and deciding to move forward uh, with that thing. Um, I don't know that uh, we should come back to the table and discuss those other issues and find ways to resolve those. Because it, the funny thing is we always talk about uh, the money that we don't have, except for when we want to give money to Israel. It's funny that we never have money for Americans, but we always got money for Israel. That's interesting to me. But as far as the gridlock, I'm hopeful that Democrats and Republicans can move forward with uh, the rebuilding of the infrastructure in, in, in this nation and then come back and find that human capital is just as important. Bill King, slide in here. Do you see a, a, a collision here? Uh, do you think anything's going to get done? Well, you know, for <clears throat> a brief moment, it looked like we had a bipartisan deal, but it looks like it's falling apart. Um, AOC immediately attacked it. Bernie Sanders came up with his alternative plans, demanding a vote on that. Um, you know, I don't know. Look, everybody's in favor of infrastructure. 
if you can't get together on a bipartisan deal on infrastructure, then what can you, what problem can you possibly ever solve? And so, uh, I don't know, it, it remains to be seen. Um, you know, I, I do think that Biden basically stabbed the bipartisan negotiators in the back when he immediately turned around and said, oh yeah, we're gonna do that, but then we're gonna do this through reconciliation, which was clearly not the intent of the deal. So. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see, but I'm pretty skeptical anything to get done in Washington these days. All right, Tony, you heard it. Uh, Biden being accused of pulling a fast one. It's called negotiations where you go back and forth. Both sides need to be heard. If you're paying attention, you've got some senators, especially Markey and Markley, who said we want to include environmental issues, especially updating so that we're ready for this new era of new energy. So it means go back to the table and include some aspect of that. That's one of the things that fall on the wayside, which will hurt all Americans. Additionally, elders should be up in arms because elder home care is not a big issue then, if that's what this whole bipartisan deal means. So they're back to the table. Let's hear this out and add elements that are talking about the U.S. being a leader for the environment. It makes perfect sense. All right, Tamara Bell, you have a gift for slicing through the garbage and getting to the bottom line. What's happening here? How dare the Republicans talk about the debt we getting in when they don't talk about the debt they put us in. (laughs) Trump put in more debt than any president in years, and they keep talking about the debt we getting in now. They didn't say nothing then. No, we we did. We need an infrastructure bill. Don't interrupt me, Bob. We do need an infrastructure bill. We need one desperately. I think that's what the focus needs to be on. This is not about the road over here. Every Republicans, Democrats, liberals, Sam's, everybody rides the roads. They get on the bridges. This needs to be dealt with and it needs to be dealt with immediately. You, I mean, we just saw a, a condo in Florida just go away overnight, okay? That's only a 40 year. Our roads, some of them 100 years. The bridge is 80 years, 90 years. We need to get that done quickly. Real quick, Bob, 20 seconds to rebut. Well, Rep- conservatives have been anti all this spending all along. So for tomorrow to say that Republicans aren't against that spending is just not true. Um, you know, President Obama spent more money than all presidents before him combined. President George W. Bush did the same thing. And I'm sure Joe Biden is going to do the same thing here. It's a, the problem is the Congress won't stop spending. Got to leave it there. Up next. Is it a genuine move to improve efficiency in government or just the latest power play by Harris County Judge Lena Hidalgo and her Democratic allies? We're going to talk about it after the break. Welcome back. Very quietly with zero public discussion that I'm aware of, Harris County Judge Lena Hidalgo is proposing the appointment of a county administrator with broad powers. And get this, Hidalgo could seek a vote on the measure as soon as Tuesday. The move has triggered protest among those who contend the judge is steadily stripping powers from elected officials and handing them to bureaucrats she controls. The judge says this new position will allow Harris County government to be more streamlined and is consistent with best practices. I'm going to go straight to the panel. What does this look like to you, a step toward efficiency or a power grab tomorrow, Bell? This is beyond a power grab. Harris County, we have a problem. This is not the first time. This is not the second time. This is the third time that they have done this. The first time they attempted to do this was in the beginnings of 2020 when they decided to tell all of Houston, you can't hire constables to secure you so you can feel more safe in your house with your money. And we had to kill that. The second time, they said they were going to have a conversation about an elections administrator when Chris Holland didn't win and Tanisha Husband was selected as a Democratic person for the county clerk and then Ann Bennett Harris won tax assessor. They stripped the elected powers that we had given those individuals and came up with an elections administrator that nobody had a conversation in. Listen, if this goes through, the infrastructure money that's going to come, the money that's going to come from the community development that we didn't get from GLO, your area, your commissioner that you elected won't get to say a damn thing because this executive administrator will have total power. So you don't know 
Who's going to get flooding? Who's going to get infrastructure? Who going to get what? You need to show up Tuesday and show out. You need to call in. Don't let this happen. This is voter suppression. You say you're going to Austin to tell them to stop it. Then your ass turn around and do the same thing. After the election is over, do not mm -hmm. allow this Harris County stand up. Bill King, what's your take on this? Well, it is absolutely a power grab. Um, you know, county commissioners have a lot of authority within their commission to do particular projects. They have road crews and all these sorts of things that they uh, that they control. And and I generally think that the level of government closest to the people is generally the most efficient and the most responsive. This is an effort to take that away. And by the way, let me just say that Republicans had control of the court for three or four decades, and they never stripped this power away from. Uh, uh, precincts one and two, when those were controlled by Democrats, they always allowed those precincts to run their own business. This is an unprecedented change in the way we do business in Harris County. And Harris County is going down the road that the city of Houston is, which is down the road to Detroit. And I'm telling you, I was with a major investment um, company last week talking about their investment strategies in Texas, and they've redlined Harris County. They're making no new investments in Harris County. All right, Tony, you're a supporter of Lena Hidalgo. What do you think of this move? Well, I'm reading the agenda letter for partial executive session item, and I think that's the big hurdle. It's within their power to have an executive session to make this decision. It seems like this should be very public for many reasons, including the fact that it is the po within the power of, you've got a three Democrat majority body, and they can basically, they're gonna appoint probably most likely because they have three votes this person it's a two million dollar budget item what it says in the letter is that it's supposed to take these silos and meld them i wouldn't i wouldn't doubt people doubt that so make it in public talk it out and let's see if that's the case to make sure what is behind the agenda and show that you are good stewards especially for such an issue that would put the power of the two minority, well, they're not minorities, they're, they're Anglo, the two Republican judges on the county commissioner and don't strip them of their power, but give them the voice of it because at the end of the day, the Democrats have the power there. All right, real quick, Marcus, you've got about 20 seconds. This, this is not a power grab, it's a partisan grab is what it is. The Democrats are in control and they found a way to try and keep their party in control as long as they want to. And they, they cry and whine when the Republican party does it and it's just foul play. Additionally, it's funny you wanna streamline and fix something that you say is not broken or that is broken. But when the Republicans did it in the, in the elections, you said that that was wrong. Got to leave it there. Got to leave it there. Sorry. Still ahead. Concern is growing. Can our shaky Texas grid meet heavy duty demand during the smoking hot summer ahead? I've never seen so many politically active young folks before. People think millennials don't care. They do. And I, and I tell you what, when they show up and they start running, winning offices, America's be a lot better. Let's just say faith in the reliability of the Texas power grid remains at best shaky and at worst deeply suspect. With summer barely underway, ERCOT has been forced to issue conservation alerts amid record demand and an unexpected drop in generation that despite assurances from Governor Greg Abbott that all that needed to be done was done by the legislature to ensure resilience and prevent a repeat of February's deadly winter blackout. They got the repairs done now, before the real heat of summer hits. And they, sh they should be prepared to go through the summer uh, fully capable of meeting demands. We are deeply concerned about the issues associated with all of these plants that are offline at this time. And we will be doing a thorough investigation to understand what the issues are and to um, uh, assess what the implications are for the grid. Frankly, panel, I'm worried. How about you? I'm going to start with Bob Price. Well, I, I'm concerned. I think worried might be a little bit of an overstretch, but we, you know, once again, wind generation was down because the, the winds were calm during this heat wave. Uh, power generators were offline because of repairs that were needed, and we definitely want those repairs done before the peak of the summer gets here, but nobody lost power during this, this session. Nobody was shorted. All, all the they did was just like if there was a water shortage, they asked you to cut back on your water usage. 
The fact is we have increased demand due to population increases in this state, but we haven't increased our generation capacity at that same level. And that's something we definitely need to address in this infrastructure bill. Bill King, you've written about this, raised an alarm. What's your take? The problem is we don't know. Uh, look, we had a major failure in February and we don't know what happened. Um, uh, and, and myself and many others have been calling for an independent commission to study the grid and look at this. Maybe 700, many 700 people died, $50 billion changed hands in a week, and we don't know. And I think the most outrageous thing about this is there's been all sorts of open records requests to ERICOT about exactly what, what, what went on. And ERICOT is resisting those open records requests, claiming they're not a government agency. And Ken Paxton has backed that up. Now, I think that's a ridiculous legal position, but beyond that, Greg Abbott could solve that with one telephone call to the PUC saying release those documents, all he has to do. All right, Marcus Davis, <laughs> you're a homeowner and a, and a business person. You worried about the grid? Uh, I'm worried about the grid. I'm worried about our county. I'm worried about our state. I'm worried about our nation. Uh, here, here we go again. This is a problem that we're not fixing, that we're not solving because we're too busy playing uh on for our team we're rooting for our team we bill i agree with you we, we don't know what happened but in the same vein we do know what happened we know a bunch of fat cats made a boatload of money over the last number of years neglecting what should have been taken care of we know that the people who put in a whole lot of campaign dollars got their back scratched and got their pockets filled we know what happened we know that hell people froze that's what happened and they froze out of neglect they froze out of a lack of leadership they froze out of greed all right, Tony Diaz, is hey, this man. Greg Abbott's uh, political Achilles heel? Oh, yeah. Let me put it this way. No matter how high Republican Greg Abbott sets his AC, you know he's sweating because the disaster during the winter exposed them to so many right-wing Republican primary challengers. If there's a blackout during the summer, Maybe a Democrat can even beat him <laughs> in the next election. And I think the other part, too, is I'm scared of what kind of distractions he's going to come up with, especially after Texans now found out that some of them can have their AC secretly, <laughs> secretly <Wow. laughs> manipulated by forces that you didn't really realize could have control over your own home. That's very non-Texan. Mm -hmm. I hope that the next governor of Texas will attend to this right away, because evidently Greg Abbott isn't. It doesn't have the capacity or the bandwidth to fix it. All right, we're going to have to leave it right there. Still to come, $2 billion and change, a blockbuster of a water bill dropped squarely on Houston ratepayers. Did our leaders down at City Hall have little choice but to pass the buck? It's not pretty. It's going to be ugly. Let me say that again. This week, Mayor Sylvester Turner and a supermajority on city council dropped the hammer on every business and household in Houston, raising the cost of water 47% and the price of wastewater service 63% over the next five years. Turner contends the money is needed for a federally mandated $2 billion overhaul of our city's worn out plumbing and all the current funding, local and federal, he says, is already committed. We are not going to delay major infrastructure improvements in this city. Water rate increases, like all rate, rate increases, are like herpes. They're with you forever. And I don't think that's a good thing. All right, panel, Turner says he inherited this problem, and that's true, but is this monster rate hike the only available solution Tomorrow, Bill, take it away. I don't fully believe this was the only solution. And yes, he did not start this. He's finishing it. But I don't think he should finish it on us in this way. The reason I say that is because this. When we asked, we had a uh, Carol Haddock, the director of public works, came to Super Neighborhood, and we were asking, how did y'all come up with these numbers? When they said, well, we started with the average person uh, uh, uses about 3,000, uh, a, se a senior, 3,000 a month, uh, the low-income people, uh, water. And we like, that's not even right. And one of our people told them, you got people, single moms, you got people who weren't in low income after COVID, now in low income. And you said after 3,000 gallons, the rate skyrocket, how did you come to that basis? In addition to that, we told them they're working on an infrastructure bill. And let me tell y'all, it was starting July 1st. 
okay? But Super Neighborhood sent enough people down there and got involved. They pushed it to September 1st. Then I was like, but what if you get the money for infrastructure? What if you get the money to do repairs? What are you going to do then? Carol and Evan Shabazz added an addendum that they'll look back on it. Everybody know, once that train had left that gate, ain't no turning back. Tony Diaz, uh, this sure looks regressive on the folks who can least uh, afford uh, an increase in their their weekly and, and monthly expenses. Well, the shock's going to come on September 1st because I think we can look at the history. Yes, the, the mayor and city council are backed into a corner because this is something that was supposed to happen, has to happen, and we don't want to become flint with bad water. But September, when folks get a bill that's $40 higher, $50 higher, especially after they've been watering their grass, I think right now it has to be in place to really stem the outrage and shock. And, and really, some families can really get hurt. 40 bucks for a family on a really tight income or someone who's retired, that can really take a hit. We need to find out how we're going to help them and mitigate that and spread that out among folks that can't afford it. Marcus? Has the price of fish and grits just gone up? Oh man, without a doubt. Well, let's just start with that. Great food, food price of food uh, is 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 higher than uh, uh, giraffe necks right now, and it's just it's just outrageous. But I would also say, yeah, I, I, I curbed it tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I, I would also say that this this will impact uh, not only uh, low income homes, but it'll, it'll also impact. Uh, small businesses. Yeah. But that aside, I, I, I got to agree with tomorrow. I don't understand if we have federal legislation that is currently working on infrastructure bill, infrastructure money, why are we not waiting to see if that will take place? Because it, it, when the market tells you what it can bear, you never go back. So once we get this tax on us, yeah. then they won't take it back. And I, w I would hope that some folks around the shoehorn that are supposed to be representing their districts would recognize this and stand up and do something about it. We're not saying no. We just said, hold on, let's see. 15 seconds, Bill. This was almost your problem. <laughs> oh, this is a great example of the old saying, never let a good emergency go to waste, a crisis go to waste. Um, but we do have a problem in the sewer system. By the way, we don't really have a problem in the water system. The sewer rates are going up 60%, water 40%. I don't know why we have a city council. Nobody's asking these questions. All right, we're going to leave it there. Up next, at long last, the Veep descends on our troubled border just days before the former president arrives. Coincidence? We're going to talk about it on the other side of this break. I am always amazed at the GOP wanting smaller government, except when it comes to running the state of Texas. They want big government. 156 days after taking the oath of office, Kamala Harris visited the nation's southern border for the first time as vice president, talking with immigrant children, touring a border patrol station, and inspecting a busy point of entry. Harris has drawn heavy fire for purposely postponing a boots-on-the-ground first-hand examination of the crisis on American soil. President Joe Biden's designated point person on the border reiterated her position that addressing the root cause of illegal immigration from Central America remains her principal focus. Our administration, it is important to be clear, is working to build a fair and a functional and a humane immigration system. We feel very strongly about that. And as you know, we inherited a tough situation Harris's tour comes just days before former President Donald Trump is scheduled to touch down on the border at the invitation of Texas Governor Greg Abbott, who's pledged to continue building the wall. Panel, do you think Trump's visit and Abbott's high-profile actions have forced the Biden administration's hand? Bob Price, we always start with you on the border. Well, clearly the, the visit upcoming visit from the former president forced the vice president's hand. She was put in charge of this 156 days ago, and this is her first trip to the border. And it's not one of the busiest sectors that she went to. It's the fourth busiest, fourth out of nine sectors, which puts it middle of the pack. So she apparently didn't want to see the screaming children in detention centers down in the Rio Grande Valley sector where overcrowding still exists in the border patrol station and in the detention centers that Biden has set up all over the state. She apparently didn't want to go to see the human trafficking that's going on down there and the, um, the stashing of people in, into these 
horrific stash houses, hundreds of people in a small two bedroom house. She apparently didn't want to see the reality of people dying in the desert. 52 people have died in Brooks County, 80 miles from the border. She doesn't want to see these things. She wants to go to a little dog and pony show photo op in one of the least, not one of the least busy, but on the not as busy as other places are, sectors of the community. She needs to get real on this. If this is her responsibility, she needs to take action and go to the Del Rio sector, go to the Rio Grande Valley sector, go to the Laredo sector, go to Tucson, where people are also, the most number of getaways are happening because Border Patrol just doesn't have time to respond. Tony Diaz, you know, I got to tell you, I don't see a ton of progress being made by the Biden administration on this. Do you see something different? Uh, yeah, I see families not being abused and stalked and separated during the Trump administration. And let's get real. This is the Abbott distraction. The only reason Donald Trump is coming is to claim copyright infringement because Abbott is stealing all his old slogans that didn't work anymore. So now he's saying build a border wall. The only thing he changed is that he hasn't said that Mexico would pay for it because it turns out Texans are gonna pay for it. He's got like a GoFundMe campaign. He's asking us to pay for the border wall. It's gonna be the same ending. Border wall's not gonna get built. And here's the other funny part. Donald Trump doesn't realize that Abbott is a lame duck. People don't want to elect him because of the power grid, which is part of this distraction. So <laughs> Republicans, aren't you tired of losing? Why you still want Trump around? If you really want to attend to the border, attend to the border, attend to the power grid, get some work done, Greg Abbott, instead of doing a, a pony and a, whatever your cliche is, stop doing these cliches. You didn't Big even team, mention the Republicans Harris. are still in control in Texas. So anyway, Marcus, you always give us a clear-eyed assessment on the border. Is anything getting better? Listen, um, it won't get better until we get serious about handling problems in in in, in our nation. I, I mentioned before, um, it's 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 a novel, or it's a it, it's a noble idea to say we want to go to the root cause, but. As I, the analogy I used before, if I've got a grease fire, I need to put it out before I go and inspect the lines to find out what the heck is happening. And now the, the, the flip side of it is the Republicans claim that Donald Trump is not their leader, but yet they cling home, hold to his testicles every day, every chance that they get. And it is absolutely amazing. The other part is, uh, you know, when you say, well, the vice president needs to come to the border. She came to, she's coming to the border. I came to the border. But then you say, well, she didn't come to the right part of the border. This is 2021. What the, how much more do we have to do physically beyond just um, going out for a site visit? I'm not saying it does not have value, but I'm talking about getting real work done. Yeah. This partisan politics of, well, she didn't come here and he didn't go there. Uh, that's for the birds, man. We got problems on the border we need to solve. All right, we're going to leave it there. Still to come, Senate Republicans seek federal election reform as the Justice Department takes aim at Georgia's new voting laws. And later, is it finally time for a third political party? We're talking to the Serve America movement about the quest to attract independent voters trapped in the middle. He's passing the uh, anti-sanctuary cities bill. He's making progress on foreign policy issues relating with China, North Korea, the Middle East. He is making progress. He's just getting his job done. The media is distracted itself. Republicans in the U.S. Senate this week blocked the sweeping election reform bill known as the For the People Act, calling it a partisan takeover of federal elections. Democrats argued the measure would preserve voting rights in states where they are allegedly being restricted. To that end, on Friday, Attorney General Merrick Garland announced the Biden administration is suing the state of Georgia over its newly approved slate of election laws. Our complaint alleges that recent changes to Georgia's election laws were enacted with the purpose of denying or abridging the right of black Georgians to vote on account of their race or color in violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Panel, if and when Texas Republicans finally push through the so-called election integrity measures smothered in the regular session, the likelihood is very high it will be greeted with the same legal counterattack from Biden's attorney general. Get us going on this tomorrow, Bill. Look, voter suppression comes in all forms. 
these same laws that you all are saying in Georgia and that they want to do in Texas. Oh my God, they taking our vote, they taking our vote. That's the same crap that Harris County is trying to do on Tuesday. Do you understand? Except they gonna let you vote let you pick who you want. The they can't do a damn thing because they're going to take away all the job descriptions. I'm telling y'all, when they did this with the county clerk and the county tax assessor, and then some dumbass person who around that horseshoe said that when we voted for those positions, we mm. didn't know they handle elections. We didn't know they do voter registration. Voter registration was higher than it's been in years. And you all sat there and didn't do nothing. I'm telling you, mm. Harris County we got a problem. You got to stand up to all forms of voter suppression. Bob, going to you, were the Republicans right to, uh, to, to stop this Democratic election rights bill? Well, absolutely. The, the state, the Constitution puts that responsibility for setting election laws at the state legislatures. This is a, a massive overreach of power grab by, by the federal government trying to do this, by the Democratic Party and the federal government. If Merrick Garland is so, so concerned about voter, voter suppression, why isn't he suing the state of Delaware, the president's home state, that doesn't even allow early voting? The, the voting laws in Georgia are much more progressive than what you see in Delaware. All right, Tony, what's your counter to that? You know what? People seem to forget the role that the federal government had in ripping apart all the different voter suppression tactics that were in place for decades through civil rights legislation. It's really simple. Ladies and gentlemen, if you get confused, these bills should be helping to make it easier for all folks to vote. It's nitpicking weird policies that don't make sense. In other words, to either chill the vote or to come up with obscure rules that are gonna either make it harder for you to vote or discourage you from voting. So I'm glad that the federal government is standing up because every American deserves the right to vote. And I wanna make it clear, there's been no, there's been no significant or important charted cheating going on right now. That's the big lie that the Trumpsters wanna further. Marcus, I just got 20 seconds left. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm flustered, <laughs> Greg, to be honest with you. I'm fed up with it. This is, I mean, this is, this is absurd, man. This is absolutely absurd. Uh, tomorrow described it perfectly. We, 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 we do one thing on one side and cry when the other side does, and then we do the same thing on the other side. I mean, this is, and right, and right now the American people are just sitting in the middle of a big old pile of padupi, and we don't do anything about it, and we get on here and we go back and forth. This is, it's for the birds, man. I don't, gotta I don't, leave, I don't get it. Got to leave it there. Hey, I think there's a new option. We're going to talk about it later. Up next, in the teeth of a Texas summer, state lawmakers headed back to Austin sooner rather than later. We're talking about the big stuff likely on the table in the special session. The president is showing who the president is. When he said what he said, he went off script. And when he went off script, he did what I have said repeatedly. He has shown America the emperor has no clothes. Welcome back. Payback time. Governor Greg Abbott this week vetoed pay for lawmakers and their staff in retaliation for the walkout of House Democrats in the waning hours of the legislative session. The protests succeeded in derailing controversial Republican election integrity measures, along with felony bond reform and a number of other GOP priorities. Panel Democrats won't have long to savor their victory because Abbott has sum summoned them back for a special session starting on July 8th. Bill King, uh, what's your take? Well, I think it'd be interesting to see if the Democrats come back or not. I mean, the way this was killed was the Democrats, uh, you know, breaking the quorum and leaving. You know, we've had this happen a couple of times uh, in the past in Texas. And uh, I think unless they can negotiate something in advance to kind of say what's going to pass, I don't see what the incentive for Democrats are to come back. I, uh, there's no way they're not going to pay the legislative staff and all that. I think that'll be struck down by the court. So that seems to me to be a little bit of the political theater. But um, the Democrats really have a chip here and if they can break the quorum. All right, Bob, you heard that. Uh, take 30 seconds. What's your prediction on this special session? Well, they're required by law to be present for the legislative session, so the governor will need to send out the DPS, Texas Rangers, and pick these people up. And if they flee out of state like they did before, then maybe they've abdicated their positions. We should appoint new legislators. All right, Tony, I'll, what do you say about this for uh, Democrats who would consider the nuclear option again? Should they use it? 
Well, you know, I, I'll just say this for sure, that I think Ted Cruz's uh, travel agent still has the tickets he used to Cancun. <laughs> to avoid the legislature, job, <laughs> To avoid his job. So that's one option. The other thing I want to say is how mean and petty. At the end of the day, this is not going to hurt the representatives who, who only get paid $7,200. So folks <laughs> take the job knowing that they don't need the money. They take the job because they can still live without that paycheck. Exactly. It's it's the poor legislators. It's the people that work on their staff. We're talking about college students. We're talking about folks working check to check. That's going to hurt them. That's really petty. I'm glad the courts will overturn turn it. I'm glad the Democrats are standing up. I'd like to actually see both parties work together to help people vote correctly coming up. So yeah, you want to talk about the voting bill, Professor Abbott, look at what's happening federally. Fix that voting bill right now when we get back and do the, do the job right so we all can vote. Marcus Davis, it was a grand gesture that walkout, but in the end, uh, it may be symbolizing not much because the Republicans have the numbers. What's your take? Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, making a statement to make a statement is making a statement, right? Um, where, where are we going with this? This is, um, as, as, what did Bob used to have a phrase? Uh, there's no there there. <laughs> there's, 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 there's no there there. Yeah, unless they do skip out on, on the, uh, the, 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 the special session. Um, here, here we go. We're on, we're on the same merry-go-round all over again. Shout Tomorrow, out to 15 Smith. seconds, felony bond reform. You want that to go through? Yes, I want felony bond reform to go through. I definitely want that to go through. And I want them to look at the damn elections administrator. I said that before. <laughs> and we still need redistricting done. All right, all right, we're leaving it there. Up next, are you among the one in three Americans who want nothing to do with either major party? The leader of a movement aimed at those in the middle is eager to offer a brand new option. Welcome back. Disrupting a political duopoly that's proven time and time again, far more intent on perpetuating power than solving the genuine problems of everyday Americans. That shakeup is a fundamental goal of the Serve America movement, an emerging moderate party seeking like-minded citizens disenchanted or worse, disgusted by the current options. I spoke one-on-one -on -one with Sam's national chairman, former Florida Congressman, David Jolly is the parties have been able to construct and insulate themselves from accountability. They've been able to construct districts that are no longer competitive. They've been able to construct a campaign financing scheme that ensures the money's always flowing to them. And as a result, that has shifted the behavior to partisanship over bipartisanship. Partisanship is now rewarded. That's the way you win a closed primary. That's the way you win a supermajority district. That's the way you gather all the big money is by acting as a partisan. At the end of the day, though, what we've constructed at SAM is a party where whatever your ideology might be, we're a, a big tent party, so we can have someone from the left, someone from the right, or someone like me whose politics are left and right. We create that coalition, and instead of coalescing around a, a a dogmatic prescriptive ideology that you have to believe this. Instead, we're saying let's coalesce voters around the simple tenet of problem solving because we believe enough independents say, I just want a government that works. And at the end of the day, if we can get the left, right, and the middle talking, we will come up with policy solutions that represent a consensus of the most number of voters out there, not simply which party won the last election and so the pendulum gets to swing their direction. Building a new political party is, is, a, is a long game, and we recognize that. But at the Serve America movement, we're serious about doing it. And importantly, we have seen the natural growth of independent politics really in the past several years, but the events of January 6th dramatically accelerated this growth in new party politics. So we continue to see the numbers grow. And as long as those numbers are growing, it says to us that a large portion of America's electorate wants a third alternative. We believe at the Serve America movement, at the SAM party, that we've constructed a coalition that makes sense for political independence. And that's why we're excited to be forming the SAM party in Texas. But for those for whom ideology does not strictly inform their politics, they just want a government that works and works for the most number of people, that's what SAM is focused on, a problem-solving approach to governing. If those two parties are your happy home, stay there. But if you're looking to affiliate your politics with something new, with something independent, with the potential to change politics in Texas for a generation, check out Sam. 
When we come back, our panel chimes in on the prospects and potential of a party pitching pragmatism. Is it doomed from the get-go or could it actually work? It's an easy deal. If you can't solve the problem when 80% of the American people agree, hashtag fire them all. That's what we need to do. Welcome back. Given the deep and often septic partisanship which divides our country, given the growing power of radical elements on both sides of the aisle, and given the near constant state of governmental gridlock and scorched earth politics, is there room in America for this moderate entry into the public square? We know our friend Bill King's answer is a resounding hell yes, because he's the new Sam Party chairman in the Lone Star State. Take it away. Bill, why are you doing this? Well, I think people who watch the show know my views about this. For a long time, the two political parties have been careening further and further off to the left and right ideological corners that they've worked themselves into. There's a lot of reasons for that, but that's where they are, and they can't seem to bring themselves back like they used to. Um, you know, there's a poll in Texas here recently, 52% of Texans said that they were moderate. So this last legislative session didn't represent those people. Uh, all, about a third of Texans now refuse to identify with either political party, and another 27% say they're only slightly associated with their respective parties. So about 60% of Texans are open to something different. And look, I just think that we want, I, like, I don't care about ideology. I'm sick of the left-right spectrum. I mean, you ask me if I'm a liberal conservative. You know, you ask me the issue, I'll tell you what my opinion is, and you can characterize that however you want to. But let's just take the grid, for instance. Right now, we need information about the grid. So the SAM party has started an online petition demanding an independent part, nonpartisan commission to study that. Fix the, uh, investigate the grid.com if you want to sign the petition. That's what we believe in, honest fact-finding, pragmatism, and get away from these ideological arguments that keep us from ever solving any problem. Hashtag fire both parties. All right, Tony, uh, are you shaking in your boots? The Sam Party's coming for your voters. It looks, it sounds like a great theory. Now we're in the first month of a decades long project. It's America, go for it. From where I'm sitting right now, it looks like the opposite of the Green Party. So in Texas, go for it, get big, because I think that's going to take votes away from the Republican Party. So I, in the future, hopefully there's more parties right now. We're, we're dealing with two, two houses and that's it. I think it's an uphill battle. Good luck, though. Marcus, they're coming for your vote. Pragmatic. You gonna give them a look? Give me 20 seconds and we gotta go. Man, I, I, I will give anything a look compared to what we're dealing with right now. I mean, this is this this shamble that we have in our nation where we have these pay for play politicians on the federal level, the state level, uh, the city county level, level, you know, uh, the county level. It, it's just, it, it's exhausting. We want real change. We want Bill King for governor. That's what I said. All right, we're leaving it there. Thanks for joining us. The conversation continues on a national level next with Fox News Sunday and host Chris Wallace. And we'll keep talking here with Watch Your Point Overtime streaming on Fox 26, Houston.com and Facebook. See you next week.